Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of BBFOhio.com and our study of Revelation 17 verse 4 titled The Golden Cup. The audio in this study is very low quality and we apologize for that, but it is intelligible and the full study is captured in this message. So we invite you to stay with us for the message titled The Golden Cup from Revelation 17 verse 4. So uh, the golden cup in uh, verse 4, and I just start out, I want to make this comment that it is simply laughable <laughs> that anyone would try to paint Islam or the United States or even United Europe as this great whore. Amen. Um, and that's why we're going line by line through these uh, verses because there are books and ministries and everything out there trying to get everyone's focus on things uh, in a, in a way that's not accurate, but also it confuses other things. In other words, if you make the, the great war Islam, then you've just messed up your understanding of Gog and Magog and the, yeah. the war and the possible war of Psalm uh, 83. And so there's a lot of things that get messed up. When you go off the deep end on one thing, it messes up a lot of things. Yeah. And uh, we've already studied these things, just as a reminder. This great war in Revelation 17 is upon many waters. It's a global, um, if it's, it, we'll say it's a city, state, and church. It has a political and a religious arm to it. And it's global. Um, it, it's said to be committing spiritual and political fornication with world governments. And that's been true of Roman Catholic history and is to this day. Um, it's full of the names of blasphemy, and we had a whole study on that. And uh, there are seven heads, which the Bible says are seven mountains, and we know we identified them as the seven hills of Rome. Ten horns, which we identified as the world government that's already in place. It's just not declared to be the world government. We still have some semblance of sovereignty left in America and other countries. But it's almost gone, folks. Yeah. Almost gone. It, the purple and scarlet we looked at and showed that it's their official garments and it's their practical garments. You see them in those colors uh, of the priesthood and the College of Cardinals is the scarlet and, and all that. And now we are going to see the cup. The chalice is another word that the uh, actual Roman Catholic Church uses for that. But the Bible describes another characteristic of the great war of having this golden cup. And it's uh, a golden cup in her hand. And that is that is not just a practical fact that if you go to Roman Catholic service, you're going to see the priesthood hold a golden cup up in worship of the cup. And but it's also in their symbolism. You'll see it throughout their literature and their uh, own symbols of this golden cup. Now let's go ahead and read this verse uh, as a reminder of verse 4 of what we're um, looking at closely in verse 4. Go ahead and read the whole verse. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet collar and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And we talked about the gold and precious stones and pearls and everything. We didn't go into great detail, but we did show that um, the Vatican has a wealth beyond uh, measure. It's the wealthiest entity on the planet. Yeah. And if you think the United States government is, <laughs> the United States government is beholden to a bunch of private bankers I like to call them banksters, who run the Federal Reserve. Yeah. The Federal Reserve is not a government entity. And our government borrows money off of a private cartel, and they're making them rich. Yeah. And that's us making them rich, basically. Yeah. But the Vatican has wealth that is not even, it's beyond, what well, it's priceless. <laughs> priceless wealth. And then it says, having a golden cup in her hand. And the cup is full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Now, to understand the place of the golden cup, we must understand the centrality of the mass. Now, we did talk about 
the Eucharist in the Mass once before. And uh, I just want you to see the centrality of the Mass. And you see what he's doing there? He is physically, literally, and spiritually worshiping. And uh, when they hold that way for us, they even look at it and say, my Lord and my God. That's part of the Mass. If you ever get to see a Mass, it's pretty interesting and sickening. <laughs> Pope Francis held Mass Friday for some 50,000 Catholics at a stadium in South Korea. The festive crowd waved handkerchiefs and wore cardboard hats with the words, Viva el Papa Francesco. Later in the day, Francis spoke to thousands of young people during a Catholic Asian Youth Day event at a venue that apparently was quite warm. I thank you for your warm welcome. Very warm, man. Eh? Very warm. In his first major speech in English, the pontiff urged young people to open their hearts to Christ. Christ is knocking at the door of your heart. My heart. His heart too. Yeah. <laughs> he calls you and me to rise, to be wide awake and alert, and to see the things in the life that really matter. This is the first papal visit in Asia since Pope John Paul II went to India in 1999. It's also the first time the Pope has been allowed to fly over Chinese airspace. Despite that gesture of goodwill from China, though, experts say his visit probably won't do much to help thaw the chilly relations between Beijing and the Vatican. It's not change. Fact, officials say Chinese authorities barred a group of Chinese Catholics from attending the events in South Korea. But for the tens of thousands of Catholics who did participate, seeing the Pope was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Francis will spend five days in South Korea. Early next year, he's expected to visit Sri Lanka and the Philippines. Wow. Yeah. A selfie with the devil. Now, <laughs> now this, that's going on all over the world. It's just crazy that you have the majority of evangelical and Protestant teachers today totally denying that this office of the Pope, the papal office, is the office of Antichrist. And that whenever everything goes down, folks, whenever 9-11 happened, the churches were packed. And that was just a couple of buildings in New York and an airplane. I and mean, can you imagine what's going to happen when the whole world really does blow up? When millions disappear, and then the whole world goes into chaos, and then you're going to have the Pope. And what you're seeing there is in the good times. Imagine what it's going to be like. People are going to be going, I'm predicting this as a Gregology, it's not Bibleology, but Gregology. I believe that they're going to give the mark during Mass. I think you're going to receive the wafer and the wine and the mark. Now, we'll be in heaven and you all can say, ha, ha, he was wrong about that. <laughs> or I'm going to say, ha, ha. <coughs> we won't be that car on that. <laughs> Shortly. Shortly. I'm just repeating myself there. But can you imagine when the final pope, who, he'll be charismatic and winsome, you know, that's, I mean, why wasn't Mitt Romney elected? Why wasn't Bob Doe elected? It has nothing to do with their politics. The reason why Bill Clinton was elected, the reason George W. Bush was elected, the reason John McCain wasn't elected, it's all about their looks, folks. And their personality. personality and Curious. looks. It has nothing to do with substance. Flattery with charisma. Well, and it, well, yeah, that's part of it. That it the winsome part of it. So do the and so flattery. you take. These popes, they even call them charismatic. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, the last pope, people just sit there and go, oh, 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 oh. you know, and you're like, that's charisma? Can you imagine if they have a young pope who's a good-looking guy and charismatic? He's going to win the world over, especially when it's in chaos. <laughs> he would have made a good one. <laughs> But anyway, back to the Mass. Um, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that this gold chalice actually holds the blood of Jesus. 
upon priestly consecration. And you ever heard the term hocus pocus? That's a corruption of the actual words they say over. Hocus corpus something or other that they say over the bread and the wine, which is supposed to magically turn it into flesh and blood. The mass is cannibalism. The mass, you if you're if you don't in the Roman Catholic Church says if you don't believe you're eating the actual flesh and blood of Jesus, you're damned. That's Catholic doctrine. And I have Catholics all over the place telling me, well, I don't believe that. I believe it's just done in memory. Then your own church damns you. Now, that's just the truth. That's a fact. And people don't want another truth. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> Some of you have been watching movies, I can tell. <laughs> now, this is from a, um, the newadvent.org website. It's a Roman Catholic website. Quote, the chalice occupies the first place among sacred vessels, and by a figure of speech, the material cup is often used as if it were synonymous with the precious blood itself. In other words, that cup, because it holds the actual blood of Jesus, that cup itself becomes... A, an object of worship. And when you see these guys looking at this cup, they are taught that they are to worship. And if they're not of a worshipful spirit when they're doing this, they're damned. And they believe it. And you can read you can read the former priest, but you can actually read actual priests who are still in the priesthood and talk about it. And they really believe this stuff. Now Revelation 20, uh, is it the right and I didn't get the right uh, text. No. This is in 1 Corinthians. Um, yeah, 1 Corinthians. Look that up, uh, Jenny and Ted, so we can fix that. Up. But the Bible says about this cup that we use. Huh? 1 Corinthians 10.16. 1 Corinthians 10.16. 10, we can fix that real quick. I almost said that. 1016? Yeah. Jenny? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, and see, when we edit that, it never happened. 1 Corinthians 10 16. Read that with me. The club. <laughs> Take three. The, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? You see, the way it was originally done is they would actually pass the bread around. You'd tear your own bread off. And then they would uh, pass the cup around, and they would actually drink out of the cup. Now, I'm all for improvisation when it comes to the cup. I don't like drinking after other people. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I like the little cups we use. I'm fine with that. And the bread, you know, you just I'm all, I'm all fine. We break it and then we pass it around and everybody takes a piece of bread. But that's all there is to it. There's no hocus pocus. You're not turning it into flesh and blood. It's the communion of the blood of Christ. It's not the blood of Christ. But that's only if you're reading the King James Version and some of the new versions leave it alone. But a lot of the new versions mess that up. In the King James Version, it says it's not the blood of Christ, but the communion of the blood of Christ. But this is what the, Rebel, the uh, Vatican Version says. And if your NIV and New American Standard translate it uh, literally. Yeah, it's still such revelation. Yeah, that's 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, 16. Why does, well, read, just read this. The chalice of benediction. That's to make you not picture just a simple cup, but to picture this golden cup, a chalice of benediction which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ and the bread which we break? Is it not the partaking of the body of the Lord? Mm. No Greek text, text even says that. They didn't, get, they didn't even translate the Greek. They're putting their own <coughs> ideas into the text. That's the Dewey Rhymes version that we just read. Yeah, it makes it a chalice of benediction instead of a cup of blessing. Wow. That's why th that I'm showing you that to give you the idea of the truth of the matter, how central this gold cup. Why would John be given this 
to emphasize in this text this golden cup. And you see why. Because the great whore itself makes that emphasis of this gold cup. Scripture makes reference also to a counterfeit cup. And we'll see if I got the right text on the wall. <laughs> Survey says, 1 Corinthians 10.1, I believe that's correct. It says, ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Okay. See, there's a difference. It's referring to two different cups. That's the cup of the Lord versus the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Okay. You see, what? 1021. 1021. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's 1021. Alright, so you have the cup of the Lord versus the cup of devils and the partaker of the Lord's table versus the table of devils. You've got what any Bible-believing church, when they take the uh, bread and the wine, and some churches use grape juice, and we're not going to get into that tonight, but you are supposed to be looking in that and saying, this is a picture of the body and blood of Jesus. When you turn it into a blood sacrifice, and at some later time, we're going to look more closely at the Mass and go into more detail with it. The Mass is called an unbloody sacrifice. And yet they do claim that this is the actual blood you're drinking. So they contradict themselves. They tell you you have to believe it's the blood of Jesus, and then they try to get around the, the fact that the Bible says not to drink blood. And the Bible says that you know, you're not to eat human beings. <laughs> And they try to get around that by calling it an unbloody sacrifice. Every pope, when he becomes pope, they give him this thing and probably buy us a new house. A golden chalice. I said worth tens of thousands of dollars when it's made. It's like when it's first made, if you were to go buy one, just like it. But it becomes worth much more with each passing year until the pope dies, and then it becomes worth even more. If you go get the chalice that this guy used worth millions and it would become more and more valuable with time after after his death and again central to what this uh, religious organization is all about now you think about this you got more than 17,000 priests you have more than 38,000 parishes they all, you have a golden cup and the whole thing set up for the church that's permanently a part of that church. It's like the Baptist churches uh, and Pentecostal churches, and they kind of have a, they get a church, one of the first things they want is a pulpit. And so you've got a pulpit in every church. Well, in the Catholic church, you've got the cup. But then each priest is also given a cup. A lot of times it's when they are ordained as a priest. And once they're able to do the Mass, they're given a cup. And they then can go up to other places and do Mass, like uh, in a nursing home or something like that. So there's 55,000 of these. <clears throat> every church and every priest has a golden cup. What you and I have, hopefully everybody in this room, what we're about is a book. <laughs> Not about a cup. <laughs> but this organization is about a cup. And I got that from uh, this organization called CARA Research. It's out of Georgetown University Catholic School. So the Vatican City State Church is identified by this Golden Cup. No other nation, organization, or entity is identified by a Golden Cup. Just that simple. That and then all the things we already listed, it's undeniable. So you see this Golden Cup in your hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. What's that mean, full of abominations? Well, we previously looked at the many blasphemies in the Roman system. And this speaks of all these as well as the blasphemies of the Mass. It's all, that cup is a symbol of the system. In their own symbology, that cup symbolizes the whole system. When you, uh, for example, when you're taught how do I receive the grace of God? What they will show in their catechisms um, 
is they'll show Jesus on the cross, and I've seen this myself. I maybe at some point I'll try to find it and give you a copy of it. The blood of Jesus coming out of his side, and that blood then comes down and hits the hands of Mary, and from her hands splashes out, and they show a cup receiving that blood, and the priest then handing it to you. That's how central the cup is in the Roman system, in the mass system. And uh, there are well-meaning Christians who think it's okay to go to mass as long as I believe that I'm only doing this in memory of Jesus. But I'm sorry, that you're either ignorantly or willfully partaking in blasphemy if you take part in a mass. And folks, there are Protestant and Baptist churches who will swap pulpits and have the Catholic priest come in their church and then they'll go to the other church and take part in the mass. There are ecumenical services where people do this. Now, it's in ignorance a lot of times. People really don't realize it. But I, I've actually talked to people. I said, now listen. When your priest is talking, they, these are Catholics who claim to be Christians. They, they claim to believe the gospel. I said, listen to that priest when he's doing his thing. And he will tell you. And they came back, why well, I never, never had paid attention to what he was actually saying. <laughs> he was saying that this thing, this cookie, is God. And he actually looked up at it and worshipped, my Lord and my God. And then they would have the cup and they would say it is the blood. It's not, they would actually say it's not a representation. It is the very blood of Jesus. And a lot of people, they just go through the motions. So they don't pay any attention to it. And the verse ends with a reference to the filthiness of her fornication. And this is both physical and spiritual reality in the Roman church. The Roman Catholic history is one of spiritual adultery that has a lot to do with what we talk about, the fornication with the kings of the earth and everything. But also the massive sexual abuse among the priesthood. Have you ever read about the nunnery brothels? Yeah. You know, um, tens of thousands of Roman Catholic nuns were prostitutes. And some of them were uh, more like concubines. There were, if you go on, um, just Google it, just in this, this summer, I'll say, just to give you a broad enough search, they have found mass burial sites of babies given birth by these nuns, and they were killed. They've also found mass burial sites where orphanages took kids in from these nuns, and they abused them, and they neglected them, and they died, and they didn't even give them a headstone or anything, just threw them in a pit. It, it, they found one in Ireland, and I'm trying to think of the other one, just in the last few weeks. And they said hundreds of skeletons. Like 800. Family. Yeah, it close, yeah. approaching the thousands. Ireland, <clears throat> and can you remember the other one? Well, I know that Germany had one. Germany? Where they had had a nunnery on one side and a, and a seminary on the other, and they found tunnels underneath. Yeah. And uh, they found holes in the tunnels filled with infant skeletons where the uh, priests and nuns would go to have sex. And you see what I was saying them. earlier, you don't have to go into the wild, wacky stuff. You just, that's the news. That's on secular news. And it's crazy as it is. And you can read uh, books like uh, 50 Years in the Church of Rome by Father Chinnicky, is that what you're Yeah. And uh, others like that who have documented this. There are nuns who've come out and written books. And uh, it's just a sad, and, the, the, the defense is terrible, too. It's always, well, you have sexual molestation in Protestant churches. and, and Yes. There, everywhere there's human beings, there's going to be sin. But not to the extent that you have in the Roman church. There are examples of molestation throughout, including public schools, public universities. But even they don't have it to the extent of the Roman church. Priesthood. Hey, folks, God made man to be with a woman. And so if you take a man and you, against his nature, force him into celibacy, you get what you ask for. The Bible says if you forbid a man to marry, it's a doctrine of devils. Yes. 
And that's what this is. It's a doctrine of devils, and it produces what devils produce. And that's child molestation, rape, and all that. And now, taking what you learned, you just added another rung to the ladder as you see who the great whore is. And I want to close with this uh, and look at a couple of verses of Scripture in closing this fact. The only way to spiritually survive this end-time apostasy back to Rome is to have a biblical attitude. You have got to have the attitude that uh, no matter what you find out, if it's true, you embrace it. If your attitude right now is not, I want truth, then you are already ripe and ready to fall for error. And too many people in the last years of my life, I've watched, I saw it before it happened. Not a prophet, not given visions and dreams. I just could see that they didn't love the truth and therefore they were not embracing the truth and they were just a step away from falling in the ditch. A passage that I would mark in my Bible is Psalm 119, 128. And that heading is wrong. But it says, Therefore, in Psalm 119, 128, Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. Look at that. I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. And I hate every false way. That's not the typical attitude today among Christians. The typical attitude today among Christians is, oh, we don't hate anything. No, you should hate some things. I hate uh, any child abuse. Is it wrong to hate that? Yeah. Was it wrong to hate what Hitler did to the Jews? Was it wrong to hate slavery? So, there are things we can agree we should hate. Why isn't one of those false ways that are sending and damning souls to hell? Mm -hmm. I mean, as bad as slavery was, as bad as the Inquisitions were, as bad as starvation is in these communist countries where the dictators take all the UN money and live off of it and still starve their people, as bad as all that is, that causes physical death in a temporary situation. But if you're a false way, you are damning souls for eternity. If you can hate these other things, you ought to double, triple hate false ways. And the fact is, is once you put Jesus in His right place, <clears throat> hating every false way is natural. I want you to look close at that. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. That means you fall in love with Jesus, you fall in love with truth. So, that makes you despise lies. Right. And the father of lies is the devil. There's something wrong today, folks. There's something wrong. Because people don't love the truth. They love get alongism. They love make it easyism. But they don't love the truth. And that leads to you loving a lie. If you don't love the truth, you're going to love a lie. And I made this little thing today. I want to share it with you. Psalm 33, 8. And again, if you're marking your Bible, this is reference to the Lord, who is Jesus. And it says at the end of that verse, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. Amen. That, that's the end game. That's what all this is about. All of our study of the book of Revelation, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. We're identifying the great course so we can understand our Bible and that we can warn people and try to help pull them out of this thing. But the end game is the revelation of Jesus Christ.